worships the Lord uh, in, in different ways, and there's different there's different uh, styles of song that we've heard tonight, and different different uh, backgrounds even. But uh, each one each person has to have their own experience to be able to truly worship God. That song that we sang, Silent Night, in all those different languages, was written by a man named Joseph Moore, M O H R, in the in the Alps. He was a pastor in the Alps in in Europe. And uh, he wrote Silent Night one day while he, he, he was a uh, pastor, but he needed to t find time to get alone with God for himself. And this morning I encouraged everybody uh, in our church to, to do that on Christmas Day, to find some time alone with the Lord and to give Him a gift. Before you open any other gifts, give Him a gift. He's given you the gift of eternal life. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but everlasting life. Hopefully you've received that gift. If you haven't, we encourage you to receive that tonight. But if you have, I encourage you to give a gift to the Lord out of thankfulness. Um, but anyway, uh, I encourage people to find time on Christmas Day to get along with God and do that. And that's the first thing. But Joseph Moore was doing that. Uh, he, he went out to find some time alone in the mountains. And he was looking out upon the, the silent night of the, of the Alps, the snow. And he, he wrote that song there in the mountains. And then he hurried over to his friend, uh, friends, uh, friends Gruber's house, who was the organ player at the church. And he said, I've just written this poem. What do you think? And he said, oh, well, I think that maybe we can sing it on Christmas Day. And so he sat down at his house, uh, or he got his guitar out in his living room and wrote the, the tune that we sing in all these different languages. And uh, then they, they went to sing it on Christmas Day at the church, but the, some mice had eaten through the pipes of the organ. And as we've discovered tonight, sometimes uh, musical things can go wrong, can't they? And uh, uh, I, I think that we had some great music. I think uh, we had great guitar playing and, and piano playing for Brother Jonathan. And uh, I messed up my, my computer accompaniment, but some of those beautiful ones, of course, uh, also were the just the, just your voices. And that's what worship really is, is from our hearts to the Lord. But they had the organ mess up that day, uh, but Franz Gruber ran home and he grabbed his guitar and brought, and that, that they sang Silent Night for the very first time in church on that Christmas morning. But uh, here on this year, what about you? Uh, you might not think that your Christmas is very monumental compared to some of these famous Christmases, or the very first Christmas, but it really was not a very monumental night uh, in all other respects uh, from what people could see, but it was the most monumental moment in the history of the world. And it never loses, it never loses that wonder if, if, you, if, you're been, if you've been born again. Jesus Christ was born so that we could be born again. Have you been born again? And uh, I hope that you have. Well, in, in our church in the past... Uh, past few weeks, we've been doing a series of messages about those people, those ordinary people who were involved in Christ's birth. We saw the different pairs of people. We've looked at Zacharias and Elizabeth and how they, they were uh, waiting for God. And the Lord, uh, the Lord was able to um, step into their life, and even in their old age, and they were able to uh, be a great part of John the Baptist being born. Elizabeth was Mary's cousin, and we saw the, the meeting of those two mothers Elizabeth and Mary and the, the, the miracle mothers there that had received a miracle from the Lord. And we saw that they were two, they were, uh, two buried partners with pure hearts. And then we saw, um, this is going to be a fourth one tonight, but uh, the, the second one we saw was two workers who witnessed for Christ. And that was Simeon and Anna. And they were witnessing for Christ. And so we not only see people waiting and people witnessing and working, but we saw this morning, we looked at uh, another, another pair, and that was Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph, they were just teenagers, but they were a, a young couple. And from, all, from all we can tell, we, we, we can guess uh, from the culture that they were probably just teenagers. And yet they were a young couple who cared about God's call on their life. And they said yes to God. They were listening. So many times people aren't listening to what God wants for their life. Uh, but I hope that you're listening. In all the busyness and all of the media and the movies and the music that you hear, may you be able to listen to God uh, this Christmas. And they were a young couple who cared about the call of God on their life. And they gave up a lot. Uh, Joseph gave up his, his carpentry business and, 
And of course, uh, they had to flee with Herod hot on their hot on their uh, tails and trying to kill the baby Jesus. And that Jesus became the center of their life. Uh, they had to give up their their work and, and go somewhere where they had, didn't have a home. And we said in Jewish culture that, uh, as a bit of review, we said in Jewish culture, the the the, the husband who was be, you were betrothed to, they had engagement, then betrothal, then the the marriage, the marriage proper. And so in the Jewish customs, um, uh, the betrothal was like like it was a binding contract, and you had to be get a divorce to get out of it. Uh, it was that binding, and yet they weren't allowed to see each other during the betrothal. And you might be able to realize, but for one year, the husband would leave, and would prepare a place, would prepare a house for the wife uh, to be, and then uh, the, on the wedding day he would come with a great group, a great party, and they bring it back to the bring the bride back to that house he prepared. And I'm, I'm sure Joseph, as a carpenter, had prepared a great house, and yet he had to leave. When he found out Mary was expecting, he thought all of that was over. But the angel told him uh, that uh, he was he took his problems to the Lord. We saw, and he was listening to God. And that reminds us of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's he's left us. Uh, he's gone to prepare a place for us. He says. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. We're his, we're his bride, aren't we? The church is the bride of Christ. He's going to come back for us. But, but Mary and Joseph, they gave all that up, uh, that house, that, that married life that everybody thought that, um, that they were going to have there in Nazareth. They had to flee to Egypt for two years, but they, they didn't mind because they cared about the right things in life. And if you care about God, you're going to face troubles in your life. But, uh, just like Mary and Joseph, but the Lord, if the Lord's the center of your, of your life, then he'll, he, uh, he, he makes it all up to us, of course, not just in this life, but with peace and joy, but in heaven, with, where it will be worth it all. And with all the rewards that that you receive as a as a faithful person, when he says, "Well done, thou good and faithful servant," but Mary and Joseph they had that little baby, and it's been sung tonight about the you know, he was like a rose, and uh, the Old Testament said he would be called the rose of Sharon. Lo, how a rose air blooming, and yet uh, the the song that uh, Natalie sang as well, uh, the rose of Bethlehem, even there there were thorns in view. A rose has its thorns, and uh, Mary and Joseph, they had the greatest privilege in the world, but they had difficulties as well, didn't they? And Jesus Christ, he, had, he was the Son of God, and yet he would have the crown of thorns upon his head. And so these, this was a young couple that cared about God, and he was the center of their life. But tonight, just for a few minutes, just for a couple minutes, um, literally, I want to talk about two more groups. They all seem to go in pairs in the Christmas story. Uh, we've seen all these pairs, and now the final pair is the shepherds and the wise men. We've seen people who've waited for God, who've worked for God. We saw this morning, Joseph, Joseph and Mary, they were walking with God. God guided them every step of the way. Uh, Joseph got directions from God. And we, we can't get directions from dreams, we don't believe, because we have the completed word of God. We, we have the whole Bible, and so we can get direction from God. We can be walking with God just like they were. But now here, the final one, jo um, shepherds and the wise men, they were worshiping God. They were worshiping God. And tonight... Hopefully, from your, from your heart of hearts, you have been worshiping God with us. Worshiping God, we can learn a lot about worshiping God from these shepherds and these wise men. But in Luke chapter 2, we see that these shepherds, they worshiped God by uh, anticipating what, what was, was going to happen. Um, by, by waiting. They worshiped God by waiting for God. It says in uh, Luke chapter 2, and verse number 8, it says, And there were in the same sh uh, country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. It says they were abiding, they were keeping watch, they were watching. They were worshiping by, by doing their work, but there's something else that I believe is true about these shepherds. These shepherds, they say that the, that the fields around Bethlehem, Bethlehem is just a few uh, miles away from Jerusalem. And the fields outside of Bethlehem was where they were, was where they kept the Passover lambs, where they raised the Passover lambs. That's what the shepherds from Bethlehem were for. I don't know if you ever realized that, um, but it was very close to Jerusalem, and I believe it was the exact same distance, if I remember from last year, as from Peterborough City Center to Whittlesea, 
was the same exact distance as from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. So it's not very far at all. And yet God didn't take the news of Christ's birth to the people in the temple of Jerusalem and the high priests and, and all those high and mighty people, uh, or King Herod or, or any of those people. Uh, we said this morning that Herod was uh, a th uh, another W in the group. He, he was somebody who wasted his opportunity. Uh, he had so many encounters with Jesus and his, his family had encounters with John the Baptist and with Jesus as well, but all they just wasted all those opportunities. But God didn't go to them. He went to these poor, lowly shepherds. Shepherds were people that were unclean. We said this morning that Joseph was a working man. And yet he still, even in his work, he, he worked hard. It was hard work as a carpenter in, in Israel because it was mostly rocks. There were hardly any trees. And, and uh, we said that a lot of carpenters in those days may have worked with rocks as well and, and wood. But uh, God didn't mind that they were working people. They, these were working people. And the Pharisees in, the, in, the, in Jerusalem, they thought that the shepherds were unclean because they were around dirty animals all the time. They lived around them 24 hours a day. And so they were constantly unclean. They were, the, they were the lowest of the low in society, the shepherds. And yet that is who the Lord went to. And so th these shepherds, they were waiting for something. And I'm sure that as they raised those lambs that were being raised for the Passover, they were thinking about the Passover lamb, the Messiah who was going to come. And for some reason, they must have had pure hearts. They must have surrendered to the Lord for the Lord to go to these particular shepherds and to tell them that he's here. Uh, good news for all people. You are representing all people, these shepherds are. And so they were, they were worshiping God by, by waiting. Now, we don't worship God by waiting for the Messiah like they did. The Old Testament people, they looked forward to Christ. But we don't look forward to Christ. And put our faith, they, they put their faith in the Messiah who was going to come, that all the Passover lambs were a picture of. And if they presented that sacrifice of a lamb from their heart, and they did it with faith, knowing that he was coming, the Bible says their faith was counted to them for righteousness. But they, we, don't, we don't look forward. We look backward to what Christ has done. And we put our faith in what he's done for all mankind. He died once for all, for all sins of the whole world. But we can wait in another way. We can be looking forward to his second coming. We can worship God by looking forward to the second coming. The Bible says that we're supposed to be uh, the Bible says there's a special crown for all those who love His appearing. <coughs> and are you loving His appearing? You'll live differently if you're looking forward to Him coming again. In, when Jesus came the first time, we said only really Simeon and Anna were looking for Him in the temple. But uh, what about His second coming? Will you be one of the few that's looking for Him when He comes? Well, they not only were <coughs> worshiping God by waiting, they were worshiping God... Uh, by, by listening to what was said, it says uh, that they, they obey. By, uh, it says here that the angel said in, in verse 15, it says, And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see the thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. They, put, they actually went and saw. Have you actually gone and seen the Lord? You can't worship God without actually going to Him and and, and putting your faith in Him. If you've never actually been to the Lord, then you, what you're, when every time you sing, if, if you don't have Him in your heart, the Bible says you have to worship with spirit and truth. If you don't have Him in your heart, you're just singing empty from an empty vessel. The, the Pharisees, they love to pray. They love to do all the outward show. But Jesus said, you're just like whitewashed sepulchers on the outside, but on the inside you're full of dead men's bones. You're not worshiping in spirit. And so, But they, they actually went and saw the Lord. And they did it with haste. And then, not only that, but they not only worshipped Him, but the first step of worship is coming and putting your faith in Christ uh, and, and obeying Him and putting your faith in Christ. But then, they, they not only obeyed in that, but they, then they worshipped God by witnessing to others. It says, And when they had seen it, they made, abroad the uh, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the shepherd, this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. So they worship God by witnessing, and then it says in verse 20, and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard. And so we can go forward. You know, I said before, you have to accept that gift of Christ. He's offering you the gift this Christmas of himself. Have you accepted that gift? But then, after you've accepted that gift, does it make any difference in your life? 
If you're a Christian, it'll make a difference in your life. It says they, they, they returned. They were different. They were glorifying and praising God. And your life is different. Your life, after you become a Christian, it should be one of glorifying and praising God. You see, other religions, man-made religions, man-made religions are all the same. Man-made religions, you can put them all together into one group, and that's they're trying to work their way to heaven. They're trying to do good works to go to heaven. Just about every man-made religion does that. The Tower of Babel, they tried to build a tower to heaven. They were working their way to heaven. And every other man-made religion ever since then has been the same uh, form as the Tower of Babel, trying to work their way to heaven. And yet, uh, these, these sh uh, shepherds, they, it was, they didn't get the cart before the horse. If you are a Christian, you don't, you're not <coughs> thanking and praising God and living differently. In order to be saved, you're doing it because you're thankful that you are saved. True Christianity doesn't say, we try to reach God, we try to reach heaven. That'll never happen. If you, try, if you go out on your way home tonight and you see somebody jumping up and down in a field, and you say, what are you doing? And they say, I'm trying to grab that star up there. You'd say, pat him on the back and say, okay, let's go home. You know, you're crazy. But it's just as crazy to say, I'm going to work my way to heaven. Heaven's perfect. God is perfect. You'll never be allowed into heaven because you're not perfect. Uh, and yet the Christmas story is we can't reach heaven, but God reached out to us. And that's what these shepherds found out. God became a man in this form of a little baby. And uh, not only the shepherds, but the wise men teach us something about worship in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, which was also read tonight. And uh, Matthew chapter 2, I should say. And if we're going to worship God, these wise men, it says they worship God by uh, verses 1 and 2. Let's, let's look at it. It says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he? that is born King of the Jews. For we have seen His star in the east and are come to worship Him. So these, uh, these wise men, they were willing to go the distance to seek God. If you're going to be able to worship the Lord, first you have to seek the Lord. Are you seeking the Lord? They says, the Bible says that they were wise men. Now they probably had been seeking the Lord by coming about 400 to 500 miles, probably on camel, or maybe on foot, but uh, why did they go to all that effort? Well, from a human point of view, the wise men already would have had everything that a human being could say that they, that they, that you, they could want. They had education, they had wealth, they had power probably, they had prestige already, they had all these things, and yet... Uh, they certainly had prestige uh, because when they were ushered in to see King Herod in Jerusalem, we know that the wise men uh, were, were ushered right in to see King Herod. So they probably had lots of prestige. We know they had wealth because they gave, because of the gifts they gave, gold, frankincense, myrrh uh, to this, this child. And, and because of the expenses of the long journey, they had everything that the world could offer, but there was something missing in their life and they... And if, you, if you're going to worship God, you have to go the distance to seek the Lord. They had a spiritual hunger that said, we need to reach the highest goal. Christ is not just part of our life, he's the preeminence in our life. The shepherds were working men. The, the, the wise men, they probably didn't work. And yet, they said, we, we don't care what we've already got. Christ is going to be preeminent. He, we don't, our life's not complete until we have him. But the working men as well, like Joseph, even though he was working, he taught his family the Bible, we said this morning. And it, you're able to do that. You're able to make Christ preeminent in your life no matter what. And, and make the time to worship God. But with all of those things they had, they, they were seeking the Lord, these wise men. They were seeking to find Him, seeking to know Him, seeking to get close to Him, seeking to worship Him. That's what they wanted to do. And that was the greatest goal. That's the greatest goal we could have in our life. To find God. To, to uh, uh, get close to Him. And to worship Him with our lives. The Bible says that's why we're created. In Revelation 4.11, it says, For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure we are and we're created. We're going to be worshiping Christ in heaven, singing that. Thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure we are and we're created. So the wise men, they go at the distance to seek him. The Bible says that they, uh, they didn't give up. 
They kept on searching. In verse 2, they're, they're asking questions. Where is he? You know, my wife, when she was wanting, she was already, she, she had, uh, grew, grew up in Corby, in Northamptonshire, and uh, she had a bit of a, a rough upbringing, and you might want to hear her testimony sometimes. She moved house 25 times before she was 18 years old, but the Lord was seeking her. And alongside all of that, there was a Sunday school with a, little, a couple with a little red car. And they used to pick her up, find her wherever she would move, and bring her to Sunday school. And, uh, and so she was learning the Bible, and all those seeds were being sown in her heart. And uh, then the Gideons gave her a, a Gideon's Bible at her school, and she, it said, if you're lonely, look up this verse. If you're afraid, look up this verse. And she'd read that every night, and those verses every night in her bed. And the Bible was, seek, seek, God was seeking her, but then she was seeking the Lord as well, asking the Lord to help her to understand more. And as she was seeking the Lord, she found him. And uh, a couple gave her a Luke's Gospel at a Christmas party, uh, when she was 12 years old, as she went out the door. And, and then she read that every night in her bed, and at the back it said, How to Become a Christian. And Natalie knelt by her bed and asked Christ to save her. And then she, but she, she still needed to know lots of things. She was very confused about some things in the Bible. And then uh, she prayed, in a, in a, uh, and she went to a place that was a bit confusing for her. For, she had lots of questions, and so she, she just went to the toilets and prayed, Lord, I don't want to fake anything. I want to know what's the truth. And, and then Mr. Pavitt from, our, from uh, the church in Corby, who's a member here at this church now, he knocked on her door when she was 15 years old. And so if you're seeking the Lord, the Lord will be seeking you as well. And the Lord will guide you in your, in your search. And the Lord guided these wise men, didn't he? And uh, they wanted to worship the Lord. They wanted to be close to the Lord. They wanted to, uh, to find him. And so the Lord guided them with a star. But the Lord guides us, of course, as well, through His Word. The Lord guides us through the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us and through uh, other uh, godly counsel and from, from people, that, from other Christians as well. And so, uh, the wise men finally found the real king in Bethlehem after they'd seen King Herod. And, uh, you know, we can also find the Lord. But you don't have to go to Bethlehem. You can find the Lord tonight. He's looking for you tonight. You can worship the Lord just like these wise men did. Uh, Je Jesus said to a, a lonely woman who was searching for, the, for something in life, she, was, she looked for it in all these different husbands. The Bible says she was uh, married four or five times. I'm trying to remember John chapter 4. And she was living with a man who wasn't her husband. And yet the, the Lord Jesus came and sat next to her one day and he said, I can give you living water. That's what you're really looking for. Uh, and it'll be a well of water springing in you uh, unto everlasting life. And uh, she said to him, um, uh, there at the well, she said, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And then she said, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And, uh, but she said, You Jews, you say you have to worship in Jerusalem. Uh, but Jesus said, It's not in this mountain or in Jerusalem, but you have to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. These, uh, and then she found the Lord. She found that living water. She put her faith in Him. And she learned how to truly worship God. She found what was missing in her life and she went back to witness. She went back to tell the whole city of Samaria. I, she said, I have found a man who told me everything I ever did. Is this, is, isn't this the Christ? Isn't this the Messiah? In other words, the word Christ and Messiah are the same. Emmanuel. And, uh, and so she, she, did, she was giving back to the Lord by witnessing for him. And the shepherds, they, they didn't have much, but they gave back by witnessing for him. These wise men, they, they gave back by presenting gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. It says in verse number 11, and we'll finish here, at verse 10 and 11, it says, When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. There's that word, worship. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gold and frankincense and myrrh. Are you going to open your heart tonight? You might not have gold. You know, uh, you, you, we should be willing to give in everything to God, but the Lord doesn't require that. He requires you to open your heart, though, and present to him the gift of your life. Jesus Christ has given you everything. He gave all of himself. That word Emmanuel means God with us. And when Mary held baby Jesus, she was holding God. And the, the Bible says in, in, in um, 
Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, that in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. She held all of God in her hands. God gave all of himself to us and to you. He lives inside of you if you're a Christian. But are you willing to give all of yourself to him as, as a way of saying thank you? I hope that you are, and I hope that you've accepted the gift, and then I hope that you're willing to give a gift back to him of your life. Let's sing one more song together. Brother Rudy's going to pass out um, one more song. It's not on your sheet. But it's in the sheet that it's in the songbooks that we use at the care home today. And we should have enough for everyone. The very last verse speaks about what I've been preaching about.